Fun to drink with <laughs> of the Republican <laughs> lawmakers. Todd also confirmed that Robin Voss has virtually no sense of humor. <laughs> You can always let us know if you are drinking with lawmakers at 844-967-2789. Moving Wisconsin forward one joke at a time, this is Kristen Bry with As Goes Wisconsin. Yada, yada, yada. Hello, Wisconsin! Hello! Wisconsin, welcome to the noon hour of our pre-election, our election eve coverage, because tomorrow is a big day, and I am so excited to talk to our next guest, who spent some time in Wisconsin, and maybe has a little bit more insight on some of our Wisconsin brethren than, than we do, as far as people who we don't always engage with. engage with in the same way, because we certainly are center left. And yet there is a lot of people here and across the country who are very much on another side of the political spectrum. And he has spent a lot of time with them. Our our guest is he's an academic, a journalist, an author whose work has focused on religion. And he's been covering the conservative religious movement for over two decades. And his new book, The Undertow, Scenes from a Slow Civil War, which has been described as an unmatched guide to the religious dimensions of American politics. Welcome to As Goes Wisconsin, Jeff Charlotte. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us today. And I think so Jane was the one who found an interview with you, I think, in The Guardian, talking about this book, talking about the conversations you've been having. But before we get into because I'm so interested in how you approach those conversations, because I think a lot of us don't know how to, whether it's with family members or friends, but also at a larger scale of how to talk to people where it feels like we don't agree that gravity is real. <laughs> and but before we do that, I guess for your career, like you've you've focused on religion for two decades. So what was it about the conservative movement that drew you to it in the first place? I mean, nothing originally. I I was sort of avoiding, I didn't want to write about the religious right because I had this sort of stereotype of them as sort of, you know, Southern men in two tight suits and they're sweating and they're pounding their pulpits and pounding their Bibles. And I thought I knew what it was. And then for me, this began a long time ago, right after 9-11, when the brother of an old friend came to New York where I was living at the time. Uh, and said he was there right after 9-11 he said it was there to survey the ruins of secularism I thought well that's that's an alarming way of looking at it Mm -hmm. and um, uh, he would he had sort of left his career in finance to join uh, um, a movement dedicated to a kind of Christian nationalism elite and and you know they're every bit as critical of democracy as Al Qaeda, right? So that I said, well, I wanted to understand what drew him into it, and that was my, that was my entrance into writing about the right. And to be honest, you know, I ditched it some years ago. I was like, I've done my bit, I've done my, yeah. uh, my, 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 I, I've done my part. Um, but I was in Wisconsin, uh, partly because I have a child who. Uh, I have a queer trans child who is seeking mental health care. We found it in Wisconsin and I was in Wisconsin and there's no way of looking past, you know, we drove out to Wisconsin and it was just fascist flags ticking off the miles like mile markers. How do I tell my child, um, Hey, don't be afraid. Don't be paranoid when half the country is passing laws against their very existence. So that's what brought me back into writing about both, the right wing and religion. And that's why I was in Wisconsin. So you came here. It's interesting. So so you were in Wisconsin for a total personal reason, but then also started with the book. And so with this new, the new book, because the family was more about a a specific group versus this is more about mega conservatism. And I guess, as you said, even though you took a step back in the 20 years since 9-11, how has it shifted to where we are is does it make sense for someone who's actually looked at it and studied it to understand how we got here as far as groups that have gotten to so such violent ideations does it make sense to you 
I mean, look, I wrote in, in this book, The Family, uh, and, and people don't like to read. You can, there's a Netflix documentary. You can see. <laughs> um, uh, but I wrote then and I said, look, you know, fascism, real, true fascism and the definition of the term, um, that'll be in particular locales in the United States, but we'll never have full fascism or never face that threat. And I said, the reason was because of fundamentalist Christianity. We would never switch out uh, you know, the father, God, for the Fuhrer, for the cult of personality, which is central to fascism. Mm -hmm. And while violence has been a part of our American way for a long time, we will never embrace the explicit sadism and pleasure of violence. I was wrong. And I write in the undertow, I was wrong. And I saw it as soon as Trump came down uh, the golden escalator in 2015. I said, oh, here is, here is the fascism that this group I've been writing about has been exporting internationally. For years, here it is, come home to roost. And not just in Trump, but in all the little Trumps. I um, mean, you've got them there in Wisconsin, not just in your state legislature, but in your school boards. And uh, what I, I quote a, 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 oh God, I'm going to mispronounce it. I always do. Waukesha school board member. Yep. Uh, in the book. I did it. All right. Uh, and she said, critical race theory, it's everywhere. She says it is secret and subtle and, and strong. I'm, I'm mangling the quote a little bit. But her, her deep paranoia that critical race theory, I mean, I teach at a college. That's that's not just a college level thing. That's an advanced college level mm -hmm. thing. That this is somehow in Waukesha elementary schools. It's it's surreal, but there it is. And that's that empowered uh, extreme militance that has changed. It has changed over the 20 years that I've reported on it. The situation now is worse. It's why I call it a slow civil war. It's not a hot civil war. It's more like a cold war. But we have we have we have women dying, bleeding out for lack of reproductive rights. We have armed standoffs every week between uh, oath keepers, proud keep, proud boys, uh, three percenters with their AR-15s outside of libraries, hospitals, schools. Um, we have states criminalizing my child, your friends, everybody. Right. Um, so we're in it now. It, people say, could there be violence? The violence is here. Yes, absolutely. We're talking to author Jeff Charlotte about his new book, The Undertow, Scenes from a Slow Civil War, which is our civil war, which is what he's referencing. And in because I hear you talk about it right now, you talk about the danger of it and we're in it. And I know you were you you describe it as our condition and not a crisis because we're we're living in it. It's not something that is going to peak and then subside, right? Like it's something that we have to face that is part of our, that's become part of our culture. But as far as you have a clear point of view on it when you talk about it, when you write about it, and yet you were able to start so many conversations with people. And so what was it, how did you begin these conversations? How did you keep your I guess judgments and and your own feelings out of the conversation to get people to open up to you who obviously see a world the world so differently. Well, I'll tell you as a writer, I don't keep my judgments out of the conversation. I go into every huh. conversation. My goal is to be human, which is not always easy. We move through the world with manners and you know presentation. If I can be as human as I want that human to be with me, right? And I think of a guy named Rob Brum, a militia leader up there in Marinette, Wisconsin. And uh, I was driving around Wisconsin after Roe fell and Wisconsin, of course, became the only ostensibly blue state, right, in which abortion was illegal. And I was just stopping. At, I'm a photographer, too. I was stopping and photographing the flags and Marinette. I don't know if I can say this on your station. There was a flag that said, well, I was like, F Trudeau. Right. And I thought, well, that's an interesting choice for a Wisconsinite. Um, and I stopped to take a picture. Little did I know the family had all kinds of security cameras. They they oh. caught me as soon as I opened the door of my car and uh, they come out and uh, Rob Brum, Rob Brum, the uh, patriarch of the family, comes out in camouflage and carrying um, uh, a handgun as always carries open carries and offers me a flag. I said, well, I was interested in your flag. He says, you want an, one. I an F Trudeau flag? flag? Yes. And I'm like, oh. Is that an extra one? <laughs> it felt like maybe, I will say, look, I mean, I'm, I'm, I am myself. I don't withhold judgment. But it felt like this is not the case. You know, someone offers you something, the polite thing to say, oh, well, oh my gosh. Um, oh, thank you. Invites me in. And inside, 
he's got a pool table on which he's preparing for a training for his militia, uh, the Wisconsin 4th um, Red Arrow Militia, AR-15s, long, all kinds of long guns, a gun he incorrectly describes as the gun that Dirty Harry used. Um, and I take pride in my research. So I discovered that this massive handgun was different than the massive handgun Dirty Harry used. And his kids, a three-year-old running around who's already been trained on semi-automatic assault rifles. Um, his, his daughter with a Nazi tattoo. And we talked, we talked for hours, um, partly because this was a guy who wanted to talk um, and was afraid that his other militia members would see him as unmanly for his talkativeness. And so he welcomed me. I, I didn't hide where I was. Um, he had looping on a television in the corner a uh, video that he had taken on January 6th, where he, he had been there at the Capitol. Um, I didn't hide that I thought this was an insurrection. Um, he knew who I was. And he said, look, you might be a fed, but you didn't kick my door down, so I don't shoot you. Um, he had sort of like three tiers. And I was I was in the tier, there's, there's attacker, there's this. There's two tiers in which you get shot, and then there's a third tier, fool, which is how he saw me, and you don't get shot. And instead, he offered me, and I know this is sort of sounds like a goof, but there it was, he offered me something that was so disgusting, I've never seen outside of Wisconsin, maybe it's not Wisconsin's fault, taco pizza. Um, <laughs> Don't blame us for that, Jeff. Don't, don't blame Wisconsin. I don't think Wisconsin invented it. I said no. I said no. I took the extra dough flag and um, I said no to the taco pizza. And we talked about the guns and he even let me photograph the guns. He says, the ones that you can see are all legal, which is an interesting way of phrasing that. Yeah. Right? The ones that you can see. And um, and I think it's important. Some people say, all I need to know about these guys, you know, is where their nose is so I can give them a, a, a punch them in the nose, right? I don't think that's true. I think we need to understand the varieties of fascist thought. And I do use that word fascist deliberately. And I think we need to understand also the fault lines within it. Absolutely. And I want to talk more about that when we come back. Our guest is Jeff Charlotte, who's the author of The Undertow, Scenes from a Slow Civil War. We'll talk more about his experiences in Wisconsin and also maybe his takeaways that we can learn from as we try to talk with people who are on a very different side of the spectrum than us. This is As Goes Wisconsin. Tell the midnight rider. Welcome back to As Goes Wisconsin. I am Kristen Bry. She is Jane Matinair, and we are talking to Jeff Charlotte, who is the author of the new book, The Undertow, Scenes from a Slow Civil War. And so when we tweeted out this morning that you were going to be on the show, Jeff, you retweeted it and said that you found some hope in Wisconsin. So I'd love to hear about some of the hope that you found. <laughs> So, so, uh, and uh, by the way, I'm wearing, and, and I don't know if Wisconsin, I think this is corny, but, but I bought, I like that Collectivo coffee in Milwaukee. So I'm wearing oh, a Wisconsin, uh, there it nice. is, Wisconsin hoodie uh, as we talk, just by accident. It's just the uh, Wisconsin follows you home to Vermont. Um, I drove to uh, Black River Falls, uh, Wisconsin. I was driving around without a plan, just driving around Wisconsin, talking to folks post row. And I, I pull into Black River Falls, a little town, central Wisconsin. Some people might know it as the town in uh, a famous or infamous book, depending on your view, called Wisconsin Death Trip, um, which is not anti Wisconsin, very pro Wisconsin book. Um, and um, I see on the bridge over the Black River, this young woman holding the sign saying, your misogyny is showing. This is right after the downfall of Roe. And I circle around and there's more kids, young women, queer kids. There's a local preacher, big towering guy, shoving his belly into the face of this woman who's four foot 11, screaming at her and she holds her ground. And a cheerleader from the, the Black River Falls Tigers, Peyton, Peyton comes with her sign that I cannot say, I don't think, I can say F off. And the sign, <laughs> Jane is saying, no, no, no. Please, um, please, please, no. Uh, um, uh, I can say F off though, right? Yes, you can say yes. F off. Um, but that's her, and these are young people. Now these are not, you know, God bless Madison, but these are not Madison hipsters. Mm -hmm. These, this is a small town, Wisconsin. These are student body presidents. These are good kids and they are furious and they're furious really at me and at you and everybody who is older than them and who has failed to protect their fundamental rights to live their lives and be human. I spent some time with them and um, uh, we got to talking about this so-called civil war that every right winger, every militia man I'd met 
believed was coming. And I thought they were going to be shocked, but they weren't. They basically, mm. their attitude was in a way, bring it on. Now, that's not where I'm at. Nobody wins a civil war, but their courage and their heart, this like, this is a struggle. We're going to have to fight this. Um, they weren't saying like, why can't I just go to college and not thinking about this? They were saying, um, I'm going to have to fight for my rights. The struggle is now, it is here. And they recognize too, that the struggle is long, right? That's why I reject that language of crisis. Fascists love the language of crisis. Trump's been going around saying it's the final battle, like it's a wrestling match. No, it's not. The struggle for freedom is long. And those kids in Black River Falls knew that better than than half the New York Times editorial board. They were the ones with the heart. And they they gave me a lot of courage. That gives me a lot of courage. That's a great that's a great story. But I guess from from your conversations, from writing the book, from two decades of writing on this topic, it is long, but how do we because I think there's a debate. There's different approaches, right? There is is as simple as Marjorie Taylor Greene being on 60 Minutes last night, right? I know. <laughs> and there's the conversation, though. It's like, do you, as a media, as we're in the media, any any media outlet makes, how do you, do you try to normalize to an extent because you think that there's people on that side that are redeemable, and so you want them to still be getting accurate information instead of living in their echo chamber? Or, like, how do you, like, what do you feel like, is there anything that reaches these people to bring them back? And if so, do we, how do we engage and not necessarily combat and fight? Or is that the only way? You know, I, I'm, I'm a Jew with a queer kid and um, there's actually some wealthy right wingers suing my kid's school district right now. And they are very educated people. I teach at Dartmouth College. They went to Dartmouth College. I couldn't get into Dartmouth College. They did. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know what? They're not going to convince me that my queer kid is somehow less than because they're queer. So I'm not going to convince them either. Like, there's no converting me, you know? I don't think evangelism is where it's at. I think organizing and building something beautiful and taking courage from one another is where it's at. Now, people in our families, we all have to learn how to love those in our family across some of those political lines. That we can do. But the idea that we're going to get out of this by just talking reason to a fascist movement that has committed itself to irrationalism, it's not going to happen. The right has created a, to borrow an old folk song, which side are you on? Which side are you on moment? Okay, so are you over there with the guys who are standing with their AR-15s outside the library because they're so upset because someone's telling stories? Or are you inside the library with the books, with the kids, with the people telling stories? I don't think that's complicated. Um, I think those of us with the books, with the stories, we've got something more beautiful. We can build on that. I don't think we do it by saying, hey, let's go soft on these guys. I think we say, look at this beautiful thing we have. That's interesting. And so it's is it more about because there is this these people then that they they try to make this both sides equivalence. And so what do you say to those people as far as, well, there's, you know, this side and the left and the right. And like I obviously am on the side that I do not see these two as the same. And there's fringe uh, extremists on both sides. And one is, one feels much more violent than the other. And so how do you, in learning, in, in all of this, how, how do you talk to that side, that argument of like the both sidesism? Yeah. You know, I teach at a college and it's a liberal college, the epicenter of the so-called cancel culture. And every now and then a student will say something kind of intolerant and dumb, right? An 18 year old will say something dumb. Amazing. 18 year olds sometimes <laughs> don't have fully thought out ideas. And then every now and then I go and I talk to a militia man, a grown man with an AR-15 and a whole lot of guns. And he says he's going to kill people. That's not both sides. Which yep. side are you on? Absolutely. All right. Well, Jeff Charlotte, this was such, I wish we had more time with you. Thank you so much for spending time with us. The book is The Undertow, Scenes from a Slow Civil War. We will link where you can buy it uh, on our show notes for today. But thank you. I can't wait to see what you come next. Uh, and you're always welcome to come back on the show. Thank you, Kristen. Thanks, Jane.